Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at the brand new 1 to 70 second scale B24H Liberator by Airfix. Highly anticipated kit this, so let's have a look. So then, to get the ball rolling on this behemoth of a kit, I'm going to be cementing the control panel to the cockpit floor. A throttle quadrant piece can then also be slapped on top of this before cementing both of the very very small control columns in place. With the teeny control columns all cemented down I can turn my attention to having a little look at the seats. The seats interestingly are made out of two parts so this kind of took me by surprise purely because on such a scale where everything is so small you'd assume manufacturers skimp out and just do one piece seats but not airfix this means that it is absolutely oozing with detail. On screen now you can see me cementing in place two of the panels for either side of the cockpit. Do beware there are some eject pin marks underneath this which could have a little bit of an effect on fitment but not in my case. Referring to the instructions, this specific part must be filled up with any nose weight that you use. I mean, I use liquid gravity, but you can use whatever you want. It requires at least 35 grams. However, I put as much as I could in there, and I suggest you do the same. Because of the Liberator's hugely unique, you see what I did there, tailplane, you really do need as much nose weight as you can get, so don't skimp out here. It was then time to build up the inners of the two fuselage halves. On screen, as you saw, I was fitting in the little station where the machine guns, the side mounted machine guns that is, will be sitting. And here you can see me putting together the ammunition box. Now going back to have a look at the machine gun stations, a tank can be cemented on before then the sidewall has to be fitted. This sidewall doesn't have the most positive of places to cement onto. It definitely took me a while and a couple of head scratches to understand where the instructions were telling me to put it. But you might see that there is ridges along the edge of this part and these actually snap onto the locating struts on the inner wall of the fuselage. And just like that, we are on to the first bit of paint for this build. There are also an awful lot of sub-assemblies, as you can see, for me to get through. Firstly, they are all going to be primed in SMS's Surfacer Black. Now is a good time to mention that all of the parts in this Liberator kit are in the new style of Airfix plastic. If you're unfamiliar, this is a slightly harder compound of plastic and a little bit less soapy. That being said, it is still a little bit more on the oily side, so make sure you give all your parts a nice good scrub and use primer when you can. Now that I have a nice black base to work off of, I can start getting some paint down. As you saw, I'm going to be using Ammo Mix A220, which is Zinc Chromate Interior Green. The paint is going to be thinned at about a ratio of 50% thinner to 50% paint, and I'm spraying down at about 12 psi. But as you can see on screen, I'm not spraying it very uniformly currently. Instead, we're going with a squiggle squiggle motion. And what I'm trying to do with this squiggle squiggle motion is use an effect called black basing. And what black basing pretty much is, is I'm going to utilize that black prime base to create some modulation and fake shadows on the surface of my paint. So the squiggle squiggle motion pretty much just means I have a little bit more of a patchy base. As you can see, there's one or two bits of black showing through and I'm directing all of the paint flow at the moment in the middle of all of these struts. In the upcoming clips, you will see how I then start to blend everything back in and it really starts to shine and show through different aspects of the surface detail. As you can see on screen, I have finished that base layer of squiggles and I've highlighted all of the surface details which I think should be highlighted. What I now do is I add another 10% of thinner to my mixture and do really, really uniform spraying over to equally blend everything in and make it look a little bit less uh, weird, let's just say. Slow and steady definitely wins the race here, so be really, really gentle and careful when you're building up your layers, otherwise you might lose all of that effect which you spent so much time on. And ta-da, look, all done. We have a great base layer to now work off of. However, what we do need to do is finish off certain areas like the bomb bay and spray them in the allocated colors. In this case, it is going to be Super Metallic 208, which is Super Dura Aluminum. There is no fancy techniques here, we are just trying to get a nice uniform base and I'll break that up later with washes or other little methods, but if I do, I I'll cover them. Do not worry, do not worry. I now have the most satisfying task of removing the masking tape and that was the side wall all completed in terms of base colours. Now scaling things back down a little bit we're going to be doing some detail painting. I think, I think on screen I'm painting a radio communications panel if I'm wrong, please do let me know. 
But pretty much what I'm going to be doing now is going through the entirety of the interior and all of the sub assemblies and picking out the details which have to be picked out. So as you can see on screen now, I'm going to be using some reds to pick out some buttons. Now here on screen, I'm using brass to pick out the ammunition. That's done for the other ammunition boxes as well. You can see that little seat there that was picked out with leather. So all I'm trying to do is just start to make everything look more realistic. I now made the decision to bring a couple of the sub assemblies together. So here you can see the bomb site and the ammunition, another ammunition box here going into one of the side walls and just starting to bring everything a little bit more closer to completion so that when I do have to eventually bring everything together for the interior, it's not as much of a job. Now to seal in all the blood, sweat and tears that went into the paint job, I'm just going to be using a semi-gloss varnish. This also acts as a great base for any weathering that I'm going to do. Here you can see me using a Mr. Weathering Colour Ground Brown. I add 20% of odorless thinner into this mixture just to help it flow a little bit and then it can be applied onto designated areas. To help me think where wash should be applied, I like to imagine in my head that I've shrunk myself down to 1 to 70 second scale and I'm walking around this aircraft and I'm thinking where is going to get the most use and where is dirt going to build up. So of course there's going to be quite a lot of dirt build up around the machine gun station as that is where some of the air crew will be spending a lot of their time. Also you can see the struts on the inside of both of the fuselage halves. There would definitely be quite a lot of dirt accumulating at the base of them. Any excess wash is then taken out and diffused out into the surroundings using some more white spirit. Making the most of the fact that the entire model pretty much had a semi-gloss varnish, I applied the required decals. Really the only one that had to be applied was on the control panel and this is a one piece decal and fits perfectly. The final pieces can now be assembled and cemented into their designated areas and then everything gets a lovely coat of VMS's matte varnish and that seals everything in once again and gives a really nice finish. Once the mat had been applied and I was scanning over everything, I realised that certain aspects of the interior just looked a little bit flat. So to break them up and bring some of the details back out, I'm going to just dry brush on some oil brusher in the dust colour. This just makes everything pop that little bit more. Do make sure to work quite quickly when you are using oil brusher as it dries super super duper quickly. So uh, yeah, it just sometimes get a bit sticky and a little bit harder to brush. Once I was happy and suitably pleased with how everything was looking, I gave the go ahead to bring all of the sub assemblies together. This started off with the navigator's workstation and then was swiftly followed by the nice big double wing spar. A bulkhead for the bomb bay can then also be cemented beneath the wing spar. This slots into place with relative ease, however do it quite quickly as you would like a little bit of flex in that wing spar to help it get into position. The machine gunner's workstation then slots in to the end of the wing spar with a very nice audible snap. It, it just sounds so good when things snap into place, I don't know why. Something I would like to say is do spend your time here. There is an awful lot of sub-assemblies. I think you're getting on about close to 10 sub-assemblies inside here and you need all of them to be in perfect place to ensure that you don't have any fitment issues later on in the build when you're putting the two fuse large halves together. So take your time, do lots of dry fits, and this kit will definitely treat you nicely. Although there are 10 sub assemblies, the reward that you get is an immense amount of detail. Five, six years ago, if you had this sort of detail on a one to 48 scale kit, I don't think many people would be complaining, but let alone this is one to 70 second scale. How insane is that? Hopefully there'll be a nice high quality uh, photo coming up in the next couple of seconds for you to have a look at that on a bigger scale. Although almost all of this will be lost within, it was a really, really enjoyable experience putting all of this together. That was definitely helped by how smooth it was to put together, as in no issues really at all. It just all clicks together in a very modern airfix type of way. The front cockpit and also bomb site area can be encapsulated with the other half of the nose, I guess. It is very reminiscent of how their buccaneer goes together in 72nd and also 1 to 48th. And then I can bring the main part of the fuselage, slip it over the wing spar and slot it into place. Don't put these together with too much force as the first time trying to put them together, I might have got a little bit um, too... Uh, 
hasty and one of the oxygen tanks on the ceiling fell off so be careful right as you can see on screen big warning what have i done wrong here well i've put nose weight in that section of the aircraft i thought i could be sneaky and put a little bit more nose weight in there however this actually later on in the build blocks where the nose gear should slot into so don't do that don't do what i did uh, and, and you will have a far more enjoyable experience later on in the build Anyway, with that out of the way, the front nose section can be cemented onto the rest of the fuselage and it fits seamlessly. Yes, there was a pun intended there. The tailplane can then be put together and it's made out of two pieces and slots on the back with no issues at all. The very unique oval shaped vertical stabilizers of the B24 are made up of two pieces on this kit and they have nice, as you saw, circular locating places or pins to ensure that they're in the right position. Now turning my attention to building up the wings, starting off by building up the two-piece gear bays. This was quite a stark change from my most recent build, which was Mini Arts P47, which was made up of 20 pieces in the gear bay. Insane. On the contrary, the only other piece in this gear bay is in fact an actuator, so a very, very quick and simplistic build up, and I'm not complaining. This can then be once again sprayed in a super dura aluminum colour, which is SM208, before being cemented to the underside of the wing. The lower half of the wing then snaps into place with the top half of the wing, but do remember to paint the inner part of your gear bay on the top half of the wing with the zinc chromate or whatever colour you think might be fit, but I personally thought zinc chromate was ideal. Now building up one of the four engines in this kit, we start off by putting the rear set of pistons on before then being followed by the front set of piston heads. And these are in very, very, very nicely molded to be honest with you. For one seventy second scale, I have no complaints at all. The one piece cowling then very nicely slots on top of this, completing your sub assembly. It's good to note that if you want your gills open or closed, you select that by or select that option by the initial piece that you build your pistons onto. The lower half of the nacelle is made up of one piece and that also cements onto the lower half of the wing. Has a relatively good fit, but I did see myself using a little bit of filler here just to smooth it out that little bit more and make it look more like a seam rather than a join. The two forward facing antennas or pitot tubes I believe they are, are cemented onto the aircraft. These are actually cemented into pre-drilled holes or pre-molded holes and they have very very tight tolerances which means you have a nice secure fit. I can now absolutely massacre a couple of sponges and stuff them into the designated areas where the turrets will be just so I don't get any overspray onto the interior which I worked on earlier and also prevent any dust getting onto any of the glass components which might be fitted now. On the whole the glass did fit very very nicely with the exception of one or two pieces one being the canopy which i found to be out by about 0.5 millimeter on one side i initially thought it was user error and it might still be user error but i did find that one of my turrets was a little bit warped later on in the build but anyway with that aside it was then time to get onto some paint initially everything was given a generous coating of mr finishing surfacer 1500 gray this showed up any defects in my job so far, however there weren't many at all and I could very swiftly move on to the actual paint. Here you can see I'm going to be using the Mr. Colour variant of paint, specifically C12 and C13, one being olive drab and the other being neutral grey. I first started off with the underside, so as you can see on screen, I'm using the neutral grey colour. Before I get carried away talking about what I'm doing on screen, it's good to talk about what tools I'm using here. So the airbrush that you can see me holding on screen now is actually the Procon Boy 0.2mm Platinum Edition. This is the airbrush which I use quite a lot on the channel and it is definitively the airbrush which I feel the most comfortable with. And in terms of mixtures, paint ratios and all of that shebang, I'm going to on the whole be using 60% thinner to 40% paint and spraying at 15 psi. So now you know what tools I'm using and how I'm using them, I can go on to talk about what am I doing with the tools? So you initially saw in the first clip me outlining all of the panels on the underside of the wing with that neutral grey colour. I then came over like on the interior and blended everything in to make it look all of that actual neutral grey colour instead of that weird patchy between primer and neutral grey. 
What this then showed, hopefully in the clip, that there was an accentuated darker patches around the panel lines, which is what I was trying to do. This should hopefully draw your eyes more to the panel lines and the underlying details on the surface. And then, as you saw, I added a little bit of white into the mixture and started to fade it away from the panels. This gives this lovely patchy and faded look on the underside of the wing and really breaks up that very monotone grey. It looks very harsh as it is now, but I assure you, the more that we go throughout the build, the more it will get blended in. And that is a neutral grey all wrapped up. To mask it off, I'm going to be using these kiddie scissors in the wave shape. Uh, yeah, I didn't think I'd be using those at the start of this build, but there we go. And then I can go on to spraying down the olive drab. The olive drab takes on the exact same process as the underside neutral grey, however this time with one or two changes. Initially in the pre-shading stage of the build, I'm not just going to accentuate all of the panels, I'm also going to create an almost it's a hybrid model effect in the actual panels. It's not a complete model, but it instead is some stringing to create some faded and almost ripped up and torn up and weathered paint underneath. On top of this, when I am creating that faded texture on top with post shading, instead of mixing up a new batch of paint using white to lighten the tone, I'm going to be using middle stone. The reason for this is middle stone is a slightly more or slightly warmer colour and it just creates that, that a little bit more desirable of a tone. On the whole, I was very happy with how this paint came out, but I think I could have gone a little bit harder on the weathering. At the end of the build, and I think you'll agree with me, it still looks quite pristine. I don't know if that is completely how I envisaged this uh, build going, but hey ho, you know, you live and you learn. Speaking of living, if you do live near or around the London area, or even if you are just passing by and you are into models, I highly recommend that you check out Hannants of London. Hannants London is my local model shop and they really have helped me improve my modelling over the past few months and they can definitely do the same for you. The gentlemen down there have several years in the modelling world and really do have the answer to almost any problem you might have, whether that be through a vast amount of hand-picked products or nifty little tricks like those scissors I used. On top of all of that, it is model heaven. It is stacked from floor to ceiling with them. So if you don't walk out of there with a new project, I'll personally be incredibly amazed. Their details are on screen now and a link to the Facebook page is down below, so go on, go, go and check them out. As discussed earlier, here you can see me using that middle stone version of Olive Drab to create that faded effect. If you pay close attention to the airbrush and how it's moving, you might see that every so often it does the occasional flick. No, no I don't have a twitch, I am doing that on purpose. What I'm trying to create is almost these streaks backward or these faded streaks going backwards. It's a little bit of a Marmite effect, you either like how it looks with these faded streaks every so often or you don't. Personally, I quite like the effect and I like to use it when I can, however it must be used in moderation. Like Marmite, you can't have too much Marmite, it won't be good for you. Going around onto the fuselage of the aircraft, here I did a, a variety of that faded sort of flick effect, but then also just blocking in some entire panels, trying to give the effect that the entire panel has been replaced with a newer, fresher one. The wave tape can then be removed to reveal, luckily, no overspray and a very nice looking paint scheme. I can now go on to paint other aspects of the build which don't require as much finesse let's just say. One of these is the leading edges. Here I did a base of aluminium, put some chipping fluid on it and then sprayed on the black. When I was removing that top layer of black I think I might have slightly overcooked it as quite a few of these chips look quite unrealistic. Uh, that, that is a battered leading edge and I know it isn't the greatest so you just have to excuse me on that one. Moving on to a little bit more of a positive, this time it's going to be painting up the superchargers. To do this, I'm going to be using three colours, that is going to be iron, brass and also a brown colour. Firstly, the entirety of the supercharger is based in that iron colour and then I'm going to pick out some highlights and raised features using that brass colour. The idea here is to make sure that when I come over with that brown colour, that these areas will look a little bit lighter and have a different tone to the rest of the area. Here I am now filling in the rest of the supercharger with that brown colour and I'm making sure that I have a uniform layer not to destroy that brassy colour. Luckily everything came out as I intended and you can see some really nice difference in tone from different parts of the supercharger. 
Airfix designers went to all the effort to create some lovely details on these superchargers, so it would definitely be rude not to highlight them. Similar to what I did on the interior of this build, I'm going to be dry brushing on some dust oil brusher to help highlight these features. I made sure to do this quite heavily as the next step which I wanted to do relied on having a good coating of this oil. Next I mixed up a burnt umber oil wash and I applied it to certain areas on the supercharger as you can see on screen now. I was quite sparing with the application of this wash as I didn't want to drench the entire thing in this quite rich tone. Instead it was good to have areas which were a bit lighter making it look a little bit uh, almost burnt and dried out. I can then use a clean cotton bud and I can streak across and what this does is the, the, the moisture of and the, a little bit of the white spirit in that burnt umber wash eats through the oil and creates some really nice streaking looking effects. All of them are then popped onto the aircraft with no fitment issues at all. A nice design feature here is actually that there are allocated shapes for allocated superchargers. I didn't realise this but they are actually different lengths the superchargers so you have to make sure they go in the right place. Now on to the first bit of building for quite a while. Specifically as you can see we are building up the landing gear legs. They are very simply all made out of two pieces which slot together without any issues and really are quite rugged and thick to hold the mighty weight of this aircraft. The wheels themselves also have quite an interesting mechanism to go together. The hub is actually almost a, a concaving shape so it can only go in one side of the tyre. Do make note of this as I spent about 5 minutes trying to shove one of these wheel hubs in the wrong side and I was getting rather frustrated until I just flipped it around and it slotted in without any issues. They can then be painted up in their allocated colours that being aluminium and of course neutral grey and tyre black and then they slot together and you might see that there is a little pin on the back of the tyre and that correlates to there to make sure that you get the flat spot in the right area so a very very nice little design feature there from Airfix. So on to the turrets, uh, this was a bit of the build which I was a little bit concerned about uh, you know I, sometimes turrets make or break a build especially on bombers so I'm pleased to say that they work very nicely, they're very nicely detailed, all go together without any fitment issues at all and the one little issue which I did have was with the nose turret. So the nose turret glass for me personally was a little bit warped out of shape so it did require a little bit of CA glue and a bit of pressure to hold it in place and get it back looking correct. On the grander scheme of things not a big issue at all and a quick five minute fix and here they were all built up looking very turrety. So it is now time to seal all of that hard work in using a gloss varnish. It's going to be in the aerosol format from Mr Hobby. This gives me an ideal base for all of the decals. The decals are cartograph and they're your usual airfix quality, great colours, nice and sharp, no issues at all. These were applied using Mr Mark Setter and Mr Mark Softer and on the whole they went down and conformed into all of the details really nicely. They are all sealed in again with a semi-gloss varnish just to give a little bit more grip to the surface and then I can use Mr Hobby's ground brown weathering colour wash all over the aircraft. The wash itself is diluted down out of the bottle by about 50%. It is good to note that on the whole you don't use the ground brown, uh, the, the, the Mr Weathering colour stuff out of the bottle as it comes out quite thick. So diluting it down using an odourless thinner or white spirit is usually a good idea. It is wiped off and then we can go on to doing a couple more sub assemblies and bringing things together a bit more. Specifically here you can see me putting on the propellers. Look how nice and big the locating pins are for this. If you watched my previous video you'll see that I had to fit a prop about three times the size of this onto something so so stubby. So mini art maybe take a small note there. The flaps can then be secured onto the underside. These have great fitment as well, nice locating places. One thing that should be noted, and it does say this in the instructions as well, is don't put the flaps on until pretty much everything is painted, as although the fitment is really nice and there's no places for them, it is quite a fragile area and an area which can be knocked off very, very easily. A couple more of the sub assemblies can start to come together now. This includes, as you saw on screen, the vertical stabilizers, a couple of aerials, and one or two other small bits and bobs. The aircraft and the other sub assemblies were now ready for a nice coating of matte varnish to bring it to its final finish. Once the varnish had dried, it was then time for the moment of truth. 
taking off my, my homemade masking. And I'm pleased to say that on the whole, it went quite well. As you can see, there were one or two small bits of overspray. This was cleaned up using a cotton bud, drenched in a little bit of Mr. Leveling Thinner to get rid of any of the stubborn paint. The out of the box bombs look really good and in scale, however I wanted to bring them to another level. And to do this, all I'm going to do is I'm going to get some Mr. Dissolved Putty and uh, brush it onto the bomb. I'm going to let it dry for about a minute and a half and then I'm going to get out my old brush and just start stabbing it and bring out this cast iron texture. It definitely takes some trial and error, but the joy is you don't have to be too neat and tidy as bombs themselves weren't too neat and tidy. All of the bombs can then be cemented onto their bomb racks and then the bomb racks are placed into the bomb bay and they can be cemented into their corresponding slots and it, it works an absolute treat this part of the build. No fitment issues and a quick five minute job. The bomb bay doors can now go on top of this and they all slotted to place once again very nicely. There is a small little lip on the inner part of the bomb bay door where I'd recommend you put some PVA glue or in my case I'm using ultra glue and then almost slide it down the side of the aircraft to get it to fall into place. Before the wings are cemented on it was time to put the rigging in place. I did this now because I didn't really want to be reaching over the wings into quite a hard to reach area. However to do the rigging I'm just using ammo mix rigging and it works really nicely. The landing gear legs can be cemented in place now. As I said earlier, they're really, really rugged and have great locating slots and they're not gonna go anywhere. They can easily hold the weight and probably more of this aircraft. The wings are then slotted into place. I had made sure to do a lot of test fitting of this uh, before I got paint on and I was confident that they would fit well and lo and behold, they fit perfectly. Flipping the aircraft over now, it was time to fit the crew access ladder. If you are a little bit concerned about this aircraft being a tail sitter, I'd highly recommend fitting this as it completely destroys any of your fears and makes it physically impossible for the aircraft to be a tail sitter. A small little negative here on the ball turret. I um, I think my brace was a little bit warped or the part wasn't completely how it should be because I couldn't get it to fit however I wanted it to. But on the grander scheme of things, you can't actually see that point and it doesn't affect the fitment at all. So you know, take it with a pinch of salt. And on to the last couple of steps now, it was time to do some exhaust stains. That was done using tire black and a bit of brown. The turrets can be cemented in and that is this build all finished up. So I really do hope that you've enjoyed this video and this build as much as I did. It was an absolute joy to put together. And if you are interested in potentially seeing this build in a little bit more detail, specifically the written format, there will be an article on this through Phoenix Scale Publications in the upcoming months. So I'll leave a link to them below if you are interested. And without any further ado, thank you very much for watching this video. Enjoy the final photos and videos and I'll see you next time guys. Bye bye.